Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Voices of Recovery. I'm your host, Michelle Ike, and this is my book. It is now available. Let's get you a little picture of that. Yes, How to Kill an Addiction, Recovery with God is now available on Amazon. So hopefully you can check that out. And that is where the Voices of Recovery began with my book. So anyway, um, every week I interview somebody who has overcome a life controlling issue with God's help. And this week, my guest is Charlie. So let's bring Charlie in. Hey, Charlie, how are you? I am blessed. You're blessed. Yes, you are. Well, thank you so much for being our guest today. And Charlie is the author of the book, Precious Moments in Hell. And this is an amazing and powerful book. So we'll be talking about that today. But Charlie, we're so glad to have you. And uh, can you tell our audience just a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, shall I start at the age of four or when I woke up? I was seven years old. I woke up a fire burning outside my mother and father's house in a rural town. And um it started, it started right there, the fire. I, all of a sudden I realized I was alive and uh, wow. it, it went kind of downhill from there. Yes. Well, we'll definitely want to share your story and you've had an extremely interesting and adventurous life. We'll be talking about that today, um, but you are an amazing woman and I can't wait for our audience to meet you. So thank you so much for being a guest on Voices of Recovery. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. And I want to let our audience know that Charlie is going to be sharing about the abuse and trauma that she endured as a child and even through her adulthood. So this is a sensitive topic. This is not a topic for children. So I recommend not having children in the room when you're watching it, if that's possible. And these sub subjects may trigger people. Uh, they are sensitive subjects. So if you have endured trauma or abuse, uh, I just want you to know that this is what we're going to be talking about. And I hope that you will stay and watch because Charlie has an amazing story of overcoming this, of walking in forgiveness and walking in the love of God and the peace of God. So I hope that you will stay tuned. But I wanted everybody to know that we will be discussing some sensitive topics today on the show. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into your story, Charlie. And let's start with the title of the book. So the title of the book is Precious Moments in Hell. And that just seems like kind of an unusual title. Can you explain what that means? Well, um, for years, because of the adventure I've been through, the ups and the downs and the miracles and uh, the beatings and the torture and, you know, still coming up revival again over and over again people said write a story you should write this story because you're going to help other people so throughout my lifetime i'm going okay god if you want me to write this story i i don't know where to begin i get seized in english how can i write a story <laughs> yeah and then uh after asking him that i woke up one morning and uh i heard just like i hear you today i heard precious moments in hell and i went what wow. that, that's that's the title of my life lord mm -hmm. all these different hells and you are that precious moment i can i can do that so actually i went with his title because i knew that answered all the all the upheavals he's the precious moment absolutely and, uh, that that's how i came up with the title and then i i started in that motive of going okay i got a title now I can write the stories. And so it started right there. That's beautiful. I love that you heard from God. I heard from God as well on what to title my book. And it's how to kill an addiction, but it's really how to kill an addict. And when you kill the addict, the addiction goes with it. And I'm not talking about physically killing an addict. I'm talking about spiritually killing an addict and mm -hmm. taking that person to the cross. But we're not mm -hmm. here to talk about my book today. But I love the fact that you heard from God on the title. And it really is the theme of the book, isn't it, Charlie? Because you talk about the trauma and the abuse and the torture, but in the midst of it, you also find precious moments along the way 
to keep you going and to let you know that God is with you. And that is critical in your journey. Absolutely. And uh, in all of the different abuse and the uh, husband's abuse and the physical torture and the emotional, all of it, it's like um, at those moments, you can't see nothing, anything but hell. Right. And, and you don't know that there is even going to be a precious moment. But every time I could turn my eyes and thoughts to Jesus on the cross, I realized that look at the hell that he, that our, my father went through, that he wow. went through. And uh, how did, how did he come out of that? I mean, and so just those thoughts right there takes you out of that hell moment into a precious moment because you're considering him and uh, how he went through all of that. I mean, uh, why am I going through all of that? Obviously, it must be for somebody else that's going to follow after me and needs a light at the end of their tunnel. So, um, so good. Yes. I love that. And you're definitely doing that by putting your story in a book and coming on shows like this to get the word out because people need to hear the message that you carry. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about your childhood. You said you kind of woke up at the age of seven. You and your two brothers live with your parents at an early age. Kind of give us a picture of what life was like in those early years, if you could, Charlie. Well, my mother was 15 when my father married her. He was 23. Uh, we call that you know, what molestation today, but 15 and 23 years old. She's four feet 11. He's six feet five. He was the ruler. He wore the pants in the family. And so... Mm -hmm. Uh, when he didn't like something that was cooked or what have you, he just put her over his knee and gave her a spanking. So kind of started there, but uh, he was a womanizer and uh, four feet 11 and you could barely read and write, you know, what else could my mother do when he left her? And so my grandmother taught her going to the bars. Uh, you can pick up men as cute and petite as you are. She had long red flowing hair and she could speak Spanish. She had fair skin. She's a beautiful woman. Um, so what man doesn't want that petite, beautiful little woman? So mm -hmm. my mother taught her how to go to the bars and bring him home. And, you know, no money, no honey is what she used to say. I, re I remember that. Wow. And she used to say, if you don't like my peaches, don't shake my tree. And it's like, okay, well, it took me a while to understand those words. But um, when my father left her, that's how she made her living. And uh, she she wasn't old enough to afford a babysitter. So putting in a, in a closet and uh, she became an alcoholic. She forgot about us in the closet. But mm. uh, she was good about putting a jar of water and a loaf of bread in that. And it was one of those closets where the beds used to be so that my brothers and I had room in there. But uh, a blanket on the floor, sometimes a pillow, sometimes not, depending on her mood. And wow. so she taught my brothers how to, I mean, they. I wasn't seven at the time. I was, we were three, four, and five when we okay. left my father. And so uh, it started there. And in, in a one bedroom place in San Joaquin Valley. And, um, you know, sometimes the, 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 a piece of bread with some sugar and butter on it was like a Thanksgiving dinner. Wow. If we could find that. We were happy little campers. So uh, putting my brother, learning, teaching my brothers how to get under the bed before my brother, my mother brought her men home. Uh, she taught them how to, when their pants fell to the floor, my brothers pulled the wallet out of there and took the cash out of their wallet, put it back in the pocket and slipped those pants right there to the end of the bed. And, but those two little boys underneath the bed, you know, they would urinate because we never knew how long the men would be there. So it kind of started there. I found out I was the oldest. So getting us out of the house, sometimes before the men came home was a blessing because we could go around the neighborhood and, and uh, steal bread out of the uh, grocery store, little grocery stores and put our fingers in peanut butter and 
you know, there you make a, with this for some reason. We always had an opportunity to run out there in the streets and get fed and huddle the three of us together. So oh, sometimes yeah. she'd leave us in the theaters and the theaters would close at night and we would be out there shivering in the cold to the police found us at midnight. So uh, neglect. And uh, when you look back at somebody at 15 years old that has three children now at the age of 18, how was she supposed to survive? And sure. um, when I had my children, I realized there's no way I could have done three kids at the age of 18. Mm. So it, it changed my perspective on my mother. Sure. Uh, and that's how she was raised. So really foster homes for we, for me was a blessing, although the, because I had an opportunity to learn other people's ways of life. We're right. a product of our upbringing, right? That's so, true. That's true. Yeah. That's, that's interesting that you can kind of look back on it now and realize, wow, she was 18 alone. And this is what her mother told her to do in order to survive. But to clarify, Charlie, you and your brothers were sometimes in that closet for days. Is that correct? Yes. Um, seven days. The neighborhood would, uh, well, we were in a duplex. So the neighbors knew we were in that house by ourselves and uh, they would tell on us and not okay. tell on us, but the authorities would, would show up and um, and find the three of us asleep in the closet or wow. maybe not asleep, but definitely hungry and cold. Oh, wow. that That's heartbreaking that you had to endure that. And you were the oldest one, but not by much, right? So no, you were kind of encouraging your brothers, but you weren't very much older than they were. No, we were 11 months apart, all three of us born in March. Wow. Can you imagine having no. three <laughs> children? <laughs> oh, all in diapers pretty much at the same time. Yeah, I, I felt for my mom. Hmm. Well, Charlie, you were, uh, you had your first communion as a, as a young girl. I think you were seven years old. Yes. And when that happened, you had what you talk about in the book as an encounter with an angel but it was actually a nun. And when you had your first communion, she said something to you, one sentence that literally changed your life and changed your perspective. Can you share that with us and talk a little bit about that? Yes, the courts forced my mother to make us go to catechism. Uh, that was their last time for taking us away from my mother. And they told her if they these kids miss a day in catechism, we're gonna take the children for good because we had already done a couple of foster homes at that time, uh, receiving okay. homes. So the nuns knew my mother was a prostitute. And uh, so when my brothers and I would come to the Catholic church, they would never hug us or touch us. I think maybe they thought we had a disease or the cooties or something from mm -hmm. prostitution. So the nuns never touched us. So this day of my Holy Communion, I'm not gonna tell you the whole story, but, uh, when I walked outside with my Holy Communion clothes and the beads wrapped around me, as soon as I stepped outside of a church, a nun put her hand on my shoulder. Mm. And we were not allowed to look left or right. We had to keep our eyes focused forward till our parents touched us to leave the catechism okay. ceremony. So the nun touched me. And I looked with my eyes to the left and down and I could, I realized it was a nun. Oh my goodness, she touched me. Aww. And then she said, Mija, don't ever forget this. You'll know who your father is because they'll treat you the same way they treated him. And, and from that very moment, there was a social service and a police car right there in front of me and my brothers and I were put in that car. We never got to celebrate with my mother again. Mm. So um, when she said, you'll know who your father is because they'll treat you the same way they treated him. That's when the torture started at this foster home for the next seven years, every day wow. bent over a bathtub, being beat with a leather belt, my brothers and I. From the back of our knee to the back of our neck, we had belt whelps, but I kept remembered 
I must be a child of Jesus because they did the same thing to him. So every trauma I went through, I thought, I must be a child of the king because they're treating me just like they treated my father. I don't really have the words, Charlie, to articulate what I'm what I'm thinking and feeling right now. But just to have that statement to cling to, I'm sure that God prompted that nun to say what he said and how that one statement literally carried you through all these years. And the Bible talks about sharing in the fellowship of suffering with Jesus when we belong to him. And uh, truly, truly amazing. When I read that part of the book, it, it brought me to tears and you continually refer to that over and over again, because through everything you endured, you had that connection to Jesus because we have a God who knows our sufferings, who understands our pain. He chose to leave the beauty of heaven to come to this fallen world and to suffer and die for us. And it's just, it's truly amazing. And I'm, I'm so grateful that that nun spoke to you. And I think it's a lesson for all of us because we see different situations and we know we really can't do anything about it. We can't fix it. We can pray for people. But just to think one word, one sentence, one statement to somebody in a difficult situation can be life changing. I mean, that's incredibly powerful. Yes. As a matter of fact, later on in my brother's life, both my brothers uh, were heroin addicts for a good portion of their life. But in their 40s, they both said, well, why didn't you tell us what the angel told you? That would have changed everything. Um, as a child, I didn't consider that. Right, right. And speaking of that, Charlie, a lot of times on my, my show, I interview people who have struggled with addiction and other life controlling issues. Uh, you have a unique story in that your life was affected by people with addictions, your mother's alcoholism, your brother's heroin addiction. Uh, if I recall correctly, some of your children struggled with some some addictions as well. So you've been around it quite a bit. You were affected by it greatly, but it sounds like you never fell into addiction yourself. Well, you know, I tried, uh, I wondered why my brothers did this and why did they did that? And why did my mother this? And why did my mother that? So sure. I touched bases with all of it. And then, but at the end of it, uh, those moments, I had to consider this isn't better than than Jesus. This isn't <laughs> this Amen. isn't you know, this is not what I want for the rest of my life and my children. Right. Uh, I don't want to be so knocked out that I, I can't see and I can't love and I can't forgive. I Amen. I I can't I I chose differently because for, for Christ's sake, what did he think? He he had God. He had the Holy Ghost. It's like, yeah. I want that for me and my household. I want that for every heroin addicted person. My brothers would beg to have me pray for them so they could sleep. And when I did, they would sleep for days. My daughter was involved in it too, in and out of prison for all the different kind of drugs she took. And it's like, now why would I choose that over this? That's not mm -hmm. comfortable, you know? Sure. And, um, so, I think yes. a lot of people, Charlie, are, are looking for something to take away the pain, to numb the pain, to make yes. them feel good. And you already had that. You already had that because Jesus did that for you and you didn't need a substance. And I think there's a huge lesson in that. I never considered that right until this moment. Yes, I I had him from the beginning and he might be small in me, but I only needed small to get through every little storm. Amen. That's, that's so beautiful, Charlie. Well, let's go back into your story. And you had your first communion. You heard from the nun, the angel that spoke those beautiful words over you. And then... 
the police were there to take you away because after many attempts, your mother was deemed unfit. And are we talking the 1950s at this time? Just to kind yeah. of give you context. Okay. And then you were put in the foster home of Mr. and Mrs. H. And you spent a lot of time in the book talking about that and the abuse that you endured and the, the beatings that you endured every morning, really for no reason. I mean, you didn't do anything wrong, but she would start your day off beating you three with a leather strap. I mean, it was she, was she trying to beat the devil out of you or yes. what was her yes, motive she, there? That was her motive was to beat the devil out of us because she didn't want us to grow up to be like our mother and our father. And uh, she's a Christian woman. She came from Methodist uh, pastor. Their, her mother and father were Methodist missionaries. They came to live with us too. And uh, so beating the devil out of us, how would we know that she wasn't right? If the police drop you off at the house there, they must be right. <laughs> she must be okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Tying my brothers up to red ant piles and oh. making us eat our vomit if we vomited. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. there was, she was the boss. We were the children. Children were to be seen and not heard in those days. Anything more than yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, or yes, sir, no, sir, was not allowed. And um, every night we, we knelt beside her knees uh, and prayed the... Um, now I lay me down to sleep. So every night for the next seven years, we were being taught how to pray. And um, I rubbed her feet every night for seven years, too. So oh. I've been a foot masseuse. I never considered that. That should be my one, one of my other projects to do. Next full time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just reading those, those uh, parts of the book, Charlie, I mean... You said she was a Christian woman and, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not here to judge whether she was or wasn't, but I didn't see any evidence of fruit in her life. I mean, if, if you don't want people to grow up to be like your mom or whomever, you know, it's the love of God. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance, not beating children with a whip daily. I mean, that just, I, honestly, it made me angry. Because for her to say that she's a Christian and pray and do all these things and yet beat you and humiliate you and torture you, um, you know, when people endure things like that, they often come out of it hating God. Because it's like, well, if you're a Christian and you're treating me this way, then I want nothing to do with your Jesus. You know, and and I feel like a lot of times people turn away from God because the ones who represent him don't represent him well. Well, the, the other thing about that foster mother is every night at her table, a dinner table, she read the little booklet, the daily word. And we know God's word never comes back void. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, she planted that in us too. And I had to consider... Obviously, I am a child of the king because she's doing all of these ridiculous things to me and my brothers. And, um, uh, you know, maybe I'm being tested for something that's coming down the road. Mm. And, uh, you know, and I in all the and she sent us to every kind of Christian Bible vacation Bible study and vacation Bible schools. And I've been at her home. I was a Methodist, a Lutheran, a Presbyterian, a four day, <laughs> I mean, seven day Adventist. I mean, we, yeah. and I look forward, trust me, to going to any church. So I didn't have to be underneath her hand. Sure. And, and that's where I learned all the different more stories about him, you know, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mighty mountains. And look what David went through. And he was the mm -hmm. runt of the family. And, and uh, and you know, I mean, if, if God is for me, who could be against me? So yes. all of those little, little seeds that were planted in me, right. uh, you know, his word never comes back void. So yeah. 
you know, obviously I must be David and this giant isn't taking me down. Amen. You know, she would always say, you know, if you had the face of a mustard seed, you could do it. Now get out there and do it. And so right. you know, those scriptures never come back void. And, um, and that's what built me up. I mean, obviously that tree was growing in me when all these other things of madness are going on because, you know, it took Jesus three days to come out of that tomb. Yes, it did. How long is it going to take us to come out of our tombs? Oh, you know, so if yeah. he lives inside of me and he lives inside of you, we're going to be able to walk through that storm. We're going to be able to keep yeah. our eyes upon him, even though we're being devastated. The darkness surrounds all of us. And yeah. Satan came after Jesus when he was in the womb trying mm. to kill these children. Wow. And he's been trying to take out us, God's other children, through broken homes, through no harm. I mean, for God's sake, our God was born in a barn. I know I was born in a in a hospital. I mean, he came for the homeless. He was homeless himself. Amen. So that's my character is built upon where Christ was at. I look more at him than my daughter coming in and out of prison, mm. her being abducted, her being hurt. Amen. If I can do it, she can do it because he lives in us. I mean, you can't do it without his presence in your world. You're in total darkness and chaos without him. And that's yeah. where my brothers were until they accepted Jesus too. You just had a mouthful, my friend. So thank you so much. And I'm just going to leave it at that. But when you said that when we focus more on him than our circumstances, that's how we get through it. And that is the key. We've got a lot going on in the world right now, a lot going on in our country, a lot going on on personal levels. And yet when we can keep our eyes focused on him, the Bible says we'll be in perfect peace when we look at him. It doesn't say we'll be in perfect peace when everything in our lives is calm and good and happy. It says we'll be in perfect peace when our eyes are fixed on Jesus. And that's so incredible. And the fact that you are saying that, Charlie, after the, the precious moments in hell that you have experienced in your life, we can take that to the bank because you've lived it yourself. Yes. Thank I, you. Who is not experienced some type of hell right now. All right. of us are. The world is experiencing hell in all kinds of ways. Satan's trying to rain upon us and take us down and smother us out. That's mm -hmm. never changed. It hasn't changed. But the precious moment is focusing that if Jesus can do it and he lives in us, we can do it too. It's like having a Corvette, brand new Corvette car, not having an engine in it. <laughs> but once the engine's in it, we can roll. Amen. So it's the same thing as either Jesus lives in you or he doesn't. Amen. That's the whole difference. When he comes inside, we can roll. Roll that stone away. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I yeah. love it. Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And if we could get a hold of that and really, really embrace that word, we could change this world for the better. Amen. Yeah, man. Can you imagine putting that spirit in a little bottle? How it would sell tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and it's free. It's free for the taking. Amen. Well, one of the things that I wondered about when I read your story and the times that you were with Mr. and Mrs. H, which went on for seven years, is did anyone ever check on you and make sure things were going okay? Or did they literally just drop you off and that was it? Well, they literally dropped us off and came to visit once a year to make sure everything was good. But this foster home was in the middle of a farm. Eventually it was subsidized and homes were built around us. Okay. So the first two homes built around us was right outside our bathroom door. And I know that they could hear us screaming every morning. Mm. And I would go out, whenever I walked out the house with my brothers, I would look to see why don't you do something? Right. Can't you hear us? Don't you see us standing on the street with a peace sheet over our head? Mm. Don't you see my brothers? 
tied to the red ant pile in front of your house. It's not okay. Does anybody hear us? Will anybody do anything? I mean, wow. but they didn't. I think a lot of people live that way. They just mind their own business. They don't want to get involved. And that's, that's truly unfortunate. Indeed it is. So during this time, Charlie, you went on a bus trip with, with your church to hear the Reverend Billy Graham. And what, what a powerful experience to hear somebody like that, a general in the faith. And on the way home, you prayed, Father, would you please give me a family who loves me and wants me? Please, Jesus, please. Amen. That brings, that brings tears, Charlie. Um, I, I was a little fat dumpling. And no, and everybody on that bus, Christian school bus, uh, didn't want to sit on my seat with me. I was fat. I wore ugly shoes and secondhand clothes. And so I sat on the bus by myself and I had my face up against the window where I could see my reflection. And mm -hmm. I remember saying, Jesus, I just want a family that loves me. That's all I want. Mm. And and I left. I hoped it would be soon in my childhood. I didn't realize it was going to be later when I had kids of my own. You said that God answered that prayer and God is faithful, but it took many years. And that was just heartbreaking to hear the, the cry of a child like that. Um, not only were you praying for a family, but it sounds like Mrs. H didn't allow you to have friends either. Is that correct? That's correct. But there was no time for friends and fun. It's mm. She never knew what day we wouldn't be with her. So she poured out all she could every day that we were there. There was no, there was no fun right there. But it was later in my lifetime. I had children of my own. My son and my daughter-in-law went to another Billy Graham crusade with me and and, um, oh, I can't even think of the place right now, Pasadena. Mm. And I was sitting in the stadium behind, touching both my 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 my, my son and my daughter-in-law and my grandson with me and watching Billy Graham down there at the bottom of the stadium and looking at the stars and the heavens and just so thankful that uh, my son would even consider going. And the Lord told me right there, I answered your prayer. You have a family that loves you. Wow. He brought you full circle, Charlie. And, and that's so amazing because sometimes when our prayers don't get answered right away or in the timeline that we want, we think, well, God isn't there. God doesn't love me. God isn't real. And yet, unfortunately, because of the choices of certain people, He's got to work through people, you know, and it's not his will that your parents split up and did what they did. It's not his will that Mrs. H tortured you and your brothers. Uh, but that was the situation that you were put in and he saw you through it and eventually answered that prayer in such a beautiful way and, and let you realize that. I, I just I just love that. It's so incredibly amazing. When we were at Mrs. H's house um, and she wasn't around, my brothers and I would sneak in my closet and we would sing the song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Mm. We wouldn't turn the light on in the closet because we didn't want our foster mother to find us. Mm. But we loved going in there because every time it was, we were in there, we would sing that song because our little hearts were broken. I don't know, Jesus, that Jesus song just, lit the closet up. Mm. We didn't understand it. Where's all these little lights coming from? It just wow. lit it up. And, but it was our our place to escape to when we met Jesus there. The best we knew that must be Jesus. We would sing Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so. And we come out of that closet fresh and new and ready for another day. That is a perfect example of a precious moment in hell right there. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I love that. Well, I'm going to read a little excerpt out of your book, Charlie. 
And this is what you wrote. Satan tried his best to break my loving heart and spirit. He knew that if I survived this torture with the help of God, I could be a witness to others that no matter how dark the shadows of hell are, God can and will get you through them and create precious moments of light through the darkness. Yeah, I think that really ties into what you were just talking about. And I highlighted that part of the book because it reminds me of the testimony of Corey Ten Boom. And I read her book, The Hiding Place. And for those of you who don't know who Corey is, she and her family were Christians who were hiding Jews during the Holocaust and they got caught and they were sent to a concentration camp. And so Corey was there with her sister, Betsy, and she at some point was released. Betsy died there and she traveled the country to talk about how Jesus love and Jesus light shines bright in the darkest places and how we need to forgive. And during one of her talks, one of the guards at the concentration camp, he was a former Nazi, came up and asked for her forgiveness. And this was the same person who had beaten her sister terribly. And Corey did not want to forgive him. Here she had just spoken about forgiveness. And she did not want to forgive this man because as soon as she met him, all the memories of the torture came back to her. And as an act of her will, she basically extended her hand to shake this man's hand, even though she did not want to. And when she did that, she could feel the love of God go up her arm and love for this person. So it's only through the love and forgiveness of Jesus. When we receive the love and forgiveness of Jesus, we can then extend it to others. Yes. And I think that this is a path that you've walked as well. Yes, it's um, it, my cup runneth over, you know, I, he, I mean, he, he dwells in me sometimes more, sometimes less. It depends on what Charlotte's considering at the moment. But at the end of the day, right. I always know that uh, there's no mountain big enough. There's no hole deep enough because mm. he, he'll rise again. And if he lives in us, we'll rise again out of these hell moments. It's He is my precious moment. He is our precious moment. And Satan would love to rob, steal, and destroy that peace, which no man understands. No man understands how you could forgive somebody that's tortured you and your brothers. But, but a man can't do it. It has to be the spirit that dwells inside of us yes. that can do it. And he's yes. free. You yes. know, how, how, it's just as easy as the coronavirus right now. Wash your hands <laughs> and uh, don't sneeze and cough on people and wear your mask. How easy is that? That's pretty simple and it's cheap. Hmm. You just need soap and water, right? <laughs> and, and with Christ, he's cheap. I mean, he's our king of kings, but he gave us him free. Amen. Freely, and freely he gives. And that's all we have to do is just believe there was a Jesus and that he crucified and got crucified and he rose up out of the grave. It's Amen. that easy. It's that it free. It's a gift. It's nothing we can earn. It's a gift by God's grace. And I'm so grateful that we have that. And I pray that every person watching this would have that too. And if you don't, all you have to do is ask. It's like Charlie said, it's really that simple. Right. It's like putting that Corvair, Corvette engine inside that Corvette so you can take off. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were there for seven years with Mr. and Mrs. H. And one day you were in PE class and you had gotten a beating. Well, you got beatings every day. And a teacher saw the scars and the bruises up and down your legs. You, you didn't want to dress for PE. You didn't want to wear shorts, but he made you. And then it was discovered and you were taken from the home. Yes, that, that one 
that one that was that was a blessing i was scared we we're going to get another i was going to get an f and they're going to call that foster mother and away we go another beating mm -hmm. but what happened was when he saw when she saw the back of my legs my brothers were both in sixth grade i was in seventh and i they called the nurse and the principal and they saw my brother's back and mine and we never had to go back to that foster home again but uh -huh. uh, a new journey started for me because my uh, foster homes didn't want three kids at a time. Mm -hmm. So my brothers got got paired together to go to foster homes, and I was off and running in another direction without my brothers. Mm. For a time, you went back to live with your mom. Is that correct, Charlie? Yes, I did. I didn't want to mm. because I found I I discovered that she was the same woman she when I was with her. She was still in the bars and still prostituting. And at the age, my age now, 15, 16, uh, what, 14, 15, I was a prime candidate to be one of those women of the night with her. And I just knew she was going to make me do that. I mean, that's that was her history, my grandparents' mm -hmm. history, right. too. So I didn't want to go with her. So at that point, she had had three more children. Is that right? She did. And she then you were kind of in charge of taking care of them and babysitting and it just wasn't working out. Right. I was mm -hmm. there for maybe one Friday night. Uh, when the Friday night came around, she came home and woke me up. And um, I knew I had to escape then because I was going to have a life just like hers. So you did run away and then you eventually went to the police. Is that correct? Yes, I did. And then from there you went into, it sounds like a series of foster homes at that point. You know, it's really odd is that that night that I ran away, I ran away to find a church that might be open in the middle of the night. I just thought um, that, that church doors were open. So I went to a couple of churches in the night. No door was on lock. I mean, no door was, was open. They were all locked. Mm. But well, that's odd. That's kind of what we're experiencing today, isn't it? All wow. these doors being locked where we can't get in. Mm. So, mm. Um, yeah, it hasn't changed. <laughs> this is wow. some war going on. Wow. Trying to keep us out of God's kingdom. Mm. Trying to take us down and rip us off. Smother us. You made a decision early in life, Charlie, that you did not want to be like your mom, that you did not want to follow in her footsteps. And it sounds like you have accomplished that in your life. Talk a little bit about that if you could. Well, I wanted to be a good example for my children that God blessed me with. Uh, you know, one, one day when I was in going to college, uh, I, I knew I had to go to college. I had to be... Um, the male support in my family, and um, uh, I had to be the beacon of light for my kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a product of my parenting, so if I had all of those foster homes, God only knows what kind of mother I was going to be like, but I didn't want to be like Mrs. H, and I didn't want to be like my mom. So uh, I, I decided I'm going to be... Uh, I'll be a welder, I'll be a machinist, I'll be a truck driver, I'll be a real estate agent, I'll be a prison a college, <laughs> a college educated woman. I mean, yes. there's anything I can't do. If God is for me, he could be against me. So my prayer is always open wide the doors you want me to go through, Father, and shut the other ones quickly so I don't waste any of your time. There you go. That's a great prayer. I love that. Yeah. I loved hearing about all of your experiences. I think you were a prison guard at one time and just how God used you in all of those different situations. And let's talk about a couple of the supernatural stories that, that you shared in the book. Uh, you, you make yourself available to the leading of the Holy Spirit and you go on these adventures and assignments from God. And I love it. But one day God woke you up and, and you kept you kept seeing the numbers two, two, two. And it sounds like you found out that your husband was cheating on you. You were going to leave, but you really didn't have anywhere to go with your daughter at that time. You kept seeing the numbers two, two, two. And then God led you to get in the car in your pajamas and take a drive. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, throughout my lifetime, I've had these little uh, uh, 
like a little light goes on and tells me something and then whoo, it happens. And I kept having this recurring dream of uh, the numbers 222 two, two for years. And my kids would go, well, mom, what do you think he's saying? I go, I don't know if it's 222 days or two people on 22nd Street. I don't, I looked it up in the Bible, Romans 222. I mean, I'm just ongoing. So one morning the Lord wakes me up. Uh, well, I'm having a dream and I see these, the hand in the sky and that turns to a finger and he writes a scripture in the sky. And when I woke up that morning, I looked up that scripture and it said, take up your bed and walk. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good. I say out loud, well, what does that mean, Lord? And he told me when I asked that question out, out loud, he said, get in your car and drive. And it was so powerful. I didn't even change my my pajamas. I slipped on my slippers, didn't brush my hair or teeth. I just got in my car because he said, get in your car and drive. Then I'm sitting in my car and I'm thinking, and I say out loud, now, where am I going? And the Lord said, 405 South. And so I started driving 405 South. I thought maybe I'm going to come up on a, a, a murder or a car mm. accident or rape. I don't even know what to experience, but I kept driving four or five south and to through cities that I didn't even hear about, El Toro, Lake Forest, all of these places I never even heard of. Mm. But he said, make a right hand turn. And that right hand turn happened to be the name of my, my name in Spanish, Carlota. And so I made a right hand turn thinking I'm going to come upon an accident because it was so necessary for me to leave in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of that journey, it wasn't anybody, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but that 222 took me to, uh, a, a, my, my son goes, I cannot believe you just bought a house, mom. I've got to go see this. And so I'm making a long story real short, but right. he, he yelled outside, Mom, come outside. I looked outside and I said, oh, on top of the mailbox was 222. Well, a person had dropped off their keys to that house the night before because he lost his wife and now he lost his children. He didn't want the house anymore. So he wow. dropped off the keys to this woman that I had wet in my pajamas. And when she allowed me into her office, for me to tell her why I'm outside in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> she pulled back in her desk and she brought out these keys and she goes, honey, I was a nun for 10 years before I took this job. Wow. I'm sure these keys are for you. You want to go look at the house? And I go, I, I, I don't have a job. I don't have money. She goes, if God opened up this door for you, he's going to handle the rest. Yes. Long story short, I got that house for free. But Amazing. More to that story, but. There is, and I love it. So people have to buy the book to read the whole story, but it's definitely worth it because it's so powerful. Well, while you're talking. It's in Laguna Hills, Orange County. It's a very influential area. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I was looking up 222 while you were talking, and I, I apologize for the distraction, but Sean Foyt talks about the number 222, and it has to do with a scripture about the key of David and unlocking doors and locking doors. So I'll have to look that up. I couldn't find it, but I know that's a number that Sean Foyt talks about, and it has to do with keys. So another supernatural thing. And I also wanted to share with you, Charlie, that when I was reading that chapter, I finished the chapter and then I checked my phone and I was looking at something on my phone and I happened to glance up and it was 222. Yes. And I, I, I just stood up and I, I just, I ran the house. I was like, wow, God, you are letting me know that this is a divine appointment that I have with Charlie. And it just made me so happy. So I Supernatural is like, really yeah. going on. It is. It is. And I, I love to see that in our lives because it's just God's way of reminding us that he's with us and he sees every detail of our lives. And it's it's just so beautiful. There's nothing like it. Yeah. I also want to, you, you shared a lot of amazing stories in the book. And unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about all of them. 
But let's talk about uh, when you were in the hospital working and a boy came in, he was, he was badly hurt. They thought that maybe he was going to die. His dad was a gang member. Tell that story because that, that was amazing. Well, I was supervising a, a large hospital in Long Beach and uh, the, the, the children's ward is where we have many cameras, make, make sure no children are stolen. And this night, a child who was dying of sickle cell anemia, he'd been in the hospital most of all his life. This was the night he was not gonna be able to breathe another, another day. So we had to allow any members and family members to come visit their their fam this this little boy. Well, it happened to be that this little boy's father was a um, gangster, and he came in with two of his homeboys wearing their flags in their pocket. I'm not sure if it was the Bloods or which ones it were, mm -hmm. but they were wearing their red bandanas, and so I'm on alert. And uh, God told me, go talk to the father, pray with the father, and I go. <laughs> Lord, that's not going to happen on, but when God talks to me, he's loud and, and right. until I make a move, he doesn't start talking to me. I can't think about anything else except what he's put on my mind. So yes. I approach this, this man on the floor and right away I have an attitude uh, with him. It's like, like, what do you want? You know, well, lip, lip, lip. And I said, sir, the Lord wants me to pray with you. No, he doesn't pray. He said, my wife does, my ex-wife over there and all their little family members over there, you do it with them. So we were starting a little crowd right there and the, and the mother and the pastors and people that were there to pray with them, they came over to me and the husband and uh, asked what the problem was. And I said, you know, God is telling me he wants me to pray with this man. And uh, I don't know why. I just do what God tells me to. So the wife and the mother-in-law and all of them go, you better pray with her. Let's get this over with. So um, he, he, he bowed his head like he's supposed to. And I said, the Lord told me to tell you, you need to go in there. I mean, he asked me, the Lord told me to ask him, is there anything that you wouldn't do to save your son's life? And no, there wasn't anything he wouldn't do. And so I said, well, God wants you to go in there and plead the blood of Jesus over your son. Wow. Don't touch him. So he didn't understand that. And some of the church people there didn't understand pleading the blood of Jesus, but they knew it was powerful. You better do it. Right. So I did what God told me to do. Pray with a man. And I gave him my message and I walked away and Tomorrow was going to be my day off. So if the cameras were watching me in the hospital that I had prayed with this family, yeah, I might get in trouble, but I have to do what God tells me to do. Amen. Long story short, uh, the director of the hospital didn't care for me. I And that's all right. So he called me in early to work on Sunday and he wanted me to be there one hour early. And I figured, well, I'm going to get my walking papers now. He okay. wanted me to meet him in the main lobby of this large hospital at a certain hour. So I approached the hospital doors knowing I'm gonna be fired. And it was before visiting hours, but the lobby was full of these people. So when I walked in the door, uh, they were waiting for me. And uh, they were pointing at me and she's here and I'm turning around looking at, at me. <laughs> so I saw my director in the background there too. And he walked away. So I knew this crowd was there for me. So. They said, do you remember us? And I said, no. So they opened up this little crowd. And in that little crowd was the little boy that should oh. have been dead. Wow. He was going home <laughs> in a couple of days. And they go, well, that's mm -hmm. not the miracle. <laughs> what? <laughs> and so behind the little boy came the father and his two homeboys dressed up in Sunday go to meet and sue. Oh. Amazing. The three gangsters were, God changed their world in a precious moment. Amen. And now they're serving Jesus. That, that was such an awesome miracle that I, my life has been full of those kind of miracles. 
That is an amazing story, Charlie. I, I love that. And it reminds me of Genesis 50, 20, which says what the enemy meant for harm, God brought good from it. And the enemy meant for that little boy to die, but not only did he live, but his, his father got saved and other people. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Yes. Well, unfortunately we're going to have to wrap this up, but I know that you were able to walk in forgiveness with Mrs. H, with your mom, with other people who had harmed you. And I think when people are traumatized and abused, they want to hold on to that bitterness and unforgiveness. I have a right to be angry. I have a right to not forgive that person. Um, talk just a little bit about that if you could and how important it is to forgive and how we really can can forgive people who have hurt us terribly. It's impossible um, to draw water out of a rock. Mm. But our God did. It's impossible to part the Red Sea so we can go to the other side. Mm. But God did. Yes. If he lives inside of me, I'm going to have the victories. But if he doesn't live inside of me, it would be impossible to love and forgive and have faith and hope for tomorrow. Amen. But when he lives inside of us, we will move mighty mountains in his name. We will carry a lantern to bring other broken people out. Absolutely. Because we've been there. We've done that. We hold the light. Mm -hmm. So when people want to know how, it's not how. It's who, mm. who lives in you. He yeah. says, you'll know the evidence of who out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth mm. speaks. Yeah. So if people are tripping on disrespectful words and I got a hateful attitude, well, I could look right in them and to tell you who's living in there, it's either Christ or anti-Christ. There's no in-betweens. It's either you're for him or against him. Choose yeah. who you will serve. And if you ask him in, he says, I'm knocking on your door. Let me in. And I could do all of this for you. So I yoked up with Jesus. He carry, I carry my cross right with him. Yes. He eat the grave and so will I. And, you know, out of the presence of this world, I'm in the presence of him. Mm. And he's there for anybody. Okay everybody somebody's nobody's homeless absolutely broken that's so good broken people that's so good charlie it's not what it's who yes and the same one who was on a cross in excruciating pain and humiliation said these words forgive them father for they know not what they do he they lives in us <laughs> and it's through his power that we can let these things go and release people who have wounded us. Yes. Amazing. Well, I finished your book and again, I loved it and I encourage everybody to get a copy and I will post the link uh, and to help you get that. But I thought it was interesting that you ended your book with the same scripture that I ended my book, which is another thing that we have in common, but you closed with this. There are so many more stories but again, the Apostle John comes to mind. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And that's John 21, 25. And the reason that the whole world cannot contain the books is because he's still writing them. Oh. It didn't end with, the, with the Bible, it didn't end with that. He's still writing those stories. He's still writing your story. He's still writing my story. He's still writing the stories of the people watching this episode of Voices of Recovery. And we're all on a journey with him. Yes. And there's nothing like it. There's nothing like walking with the Lord. Not even the grave could keep me down. Amen. Not even the grave could keep him down. That's right. Well, as we close today, Charlie, can you just speak to that person who maybe is currently in an abusive situation or maybe has endured severe abuse and torture as a child like you were. 
what would you say to that person today since you've walked through it and you've walked out of it yourself? Satan only attacks God's kids. Mm -hmm. And if he's, if you're in a situation where you're being tortured and hurt, just realize you must be one of God's kids mm -hmm. because Satan's always trying to rob, steal and destroy your hope and your joy for tomorrow's. And that's a blessing in disguise because mm. you're living a hell and the precious moment is calling on Jesus. If you're really real, let your Holy Spirit fill me up mm. and send me out because you can't mm. do it without him. But he will be faithful to come in and dwell with you. And he's the only one that never leaves you or forsakes you. Everybody else will your children, your husband, your friends, your bosses, eventually they forsake you because they have other things going on in your world. But our God, he never leaves me. He never forsakes me. He always lifts me up. Mm -hmm. He gushes water yes. for rocky areas in our world. He's calling on you. You're hearing this because he's reaching out to you where you're at. You're okay. broken, homeless, on victorious mm -hmm. life. He's victory. If you call on him, he will be there. I promise in the name of Jesus. And I plead the blood of Jesus upon all people that hear this today. Because his blood is victory over death. And death is not just manual of man's death. It's spiritual. It's mental. It's emotional. It's physical. Mm. But his spirit inside of you, come on, girl. Come on, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you can make it with him. He's Amen. coming on in. Let him in. Amen. Beautifully said, Charlie. And to repeat the words that the none who was an angel said to you after your first communion, you will know who your father is because they will treat you just like they treated him. Yes. That's it. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Thank for you. The courage it took to write your book, to share the precious moments in hell that you endured and the victory that you have in Jesus, not only in this life, but in the life to come. I enjoyed your book. I enjoyed getting to know you and interviewing you today. And I pray blessings over you and your story and that this message and other messages that you will talk about go far and wide in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And God bless your book too, Michelle. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it so very much. So thank you again, Charlie. And we'll keep in touch for sure. Thank you. I appreciate your time and God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, beloved. Wow. That was incredibly powerful. Loved her book, love her story. And I hope that today encouraged you. And if you are in a situation like she was, or if you were in a situation like she was, I pray that her words blessed you because nothing is impossible for God. So I want to thank everybody for watching this episode of Voices of Recovery. We're creating a safe place where people can go on their journey with God. If you're new to our page, I'd love it if you would give us a like or a follow so that you don't miss any of this content. And if you feel led, I pray that you will share this message out because I'm sure there's somebody on your page who needs to hear what Charlie had to say today. And I also want to encourage you to get Charlie's book, which is now available on Amazon and it's Precious Moments in Hell. And I will link that here to my page, but I think it will really bless you. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time on Voices of Recovery. Bye-bye.